Hi, What The Health Tech listeners. I'm your host this week, Mac Fuster. This is the podcast where we tackle some of the trending topics, ideas and best practice in health and social care. This week, I'm speaking to Helen Hughes again, the Chief Executive of Patient Safety Learning. Helen's passion for improved patient safety came from personal insight into the impacts of unsafe care. An experienced leader, Helen has helped many leadership roles in companies such as the WHO, Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Parliamentary Health Services Ombudsman. Uh, Last month, myself and Helen spoke about PSURF and today we're focusing on patient safety learning and the work that you do, Helen, there. So uh, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, So I guess I can start with hopefully an easiest one. Um, So tell me about the work you do at patient safety learning. What does it involve? Mm, ah, well, I'll probably take about half of you, half of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to stop me. Um, so we, what do we do? We we do kind of two main things, I suppose. We're a charity and we deliberately chose to set ourselves up as a charity. There are all sorts of different governor, governance models. Um, but we wanted to be an organisation that was very clear in our values base and our aims around improving patient safety. And, and being a charity... You, you know, you're not uh, beholden to anyone. You you have yeah. a, a governance framework. We're accountable as chief exec. I'm accountable to my board, uh, and there's a there's a framework around that. And uh, we we can campaign, and we do. We use our voice. Uh, we listen, learn, and promote the voice of the patient safety frontline. That's one of the things that is very important for us. That we understand what is happening you know, work is done rather than the work is imagined. So we we work closely with uh, frontline clinicians and patient safety leads, as well as patients and families to kind of understand what's happening on the ground uh, and what more needs to happen. So it's an authentic voice uh, speaking truth to power. And and part of the setup of the charity was we felt there was there wasn't enough of that that was going on. When you're part of a very big bureaucracy, sometimes having those powerful messages, sometimes they're messages of of accountability, sometimes yeah. they're messages of saying you need to listen. So we do that. We, we're in that classic charity space of listening, learning, awareness raising, you know, more good stuff, less bad stuff, please, uh, at policy influencing stakeholder engagement. But uh, as we've developed and we've been around for just about four years now we uh, we're moving to where we always w- wanted to develop um, once we've established ourselves and our credibility and people understand our voice and how we can contribute we want to move to that place where we're developing in partnership with others kind of how-to tools to help people mm. apply knowledge insight and learning sharing that learning either through i'm sure we'll talk about this in a minute you know our learning uh, free learning platform the hub uh, as well as some of our tools uh, on resources around our standards framework that are helping organizations implement good practice so it's it's a it's a privilege to be in that place that has both those kind of roles uh, that can operate at a global level so you know last Last week, I mean, most weeks, I'd say 40% of people that use the hub are international. So we're getting a, a, a better voice or a more uh, uh, people are more aware of us globally. We, we still do that engagement piece with WHO and, uh, and other member states, even though we're quite small, but our feet are very firmly on, on the kind of on the ground of the reality of what, what's happening and what more needs to happen. So, I mean, you mentioned there it's four years um, since it started, so that's relatively recent. So where, where did it come from? What's the history behind it? Yeah, well, the history, it predates me uh, a, a bit uh, um, in that um, it was it was a kind of patient campaigner uh, and and uh, our uh, our chair now, uh, Jonathan Hazan, who was at that time, he'd stepped down from being chief exec of Datix, which was the company he'd led very successfully for 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 very many years <clears throat> and he was was with datix as a non-exec director and and yeah. wanted to do more to be that the insights that were coming from datix as a company but but other companies as well so it was it was not 
vendor specific but the sense that there was more that could be done with the insight that was coming from vendor systems on incident reporting and risk management and that there needed to be more in the space uh, the kind of space that we're now we're now in and so he started conversations and with there was an expert advisory group about saying well what should we do what what more is needed how can we get health systems, particularly the NHS at that time, we were focused on to do more. And it, and it kind of, yeah, predated the national strategy. Um, and so I was one of those expert groups because I'd got a, a close working relationship with a number of people that were on that expert group. Um, and, and we kind of, we started to shape thinking about what more was needed. Uh, and Datex very kindly, uh, without uh, without directing any activity, they gave us uh, for a few years um, some startup funds. Um, Jonathan has uh, stepped down completely from Datex five years or so ago now, um, and he's been a very strong uh, leader for for us as a charity, but also a philanthropic supporter. So he's, you know, when he sold all his shares from Datex, he made a fair bit of money, I think, uh, and 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 that's helped us set up whilst we're becoming financially sustainable and working with partners and and others to to generate resources to help us do more of what we did. So, so I was uh, I was an expert on that expert group, but um, I'd, I'd left an, a job and was going to go back into management consultancy. Um, mm. and, and, and I was invited to come in and help shape what the organization might be to do some strategic planning, to think about governance models, to think about what our aims and objectives were. And, and I said I would do it um, for uh, a few weeks, well, a few months, I think, um, to help them set up. And then after the end of that period, we made some decisions about how we were going to take it forward. I was invited to stay on and become its first chief exec. So, yeah, that was more than a few months. And I just absolutely delighted. I mean, it is the most perfect job uh, and, yeah. and when it when it's time for me to move on whenever that is it'll be gut-wrenching because my whole career has been spent trying to have an influence and make a change and you know we we now have a vehicle with patient safety learning to actively contribute to that in a way that is very liberating it's a lot easier to do some of what we do outside of formal health system and there's a responsibility that comes with that that we could talk through but you know, we can. Uh, it, it's a it's a great place to be able to influence and and shape improvements. So, so with that in mind, then, what's your? Um, I guess what's your personal vision for the charity? What do you? What where do you see it going? You know, what would you like to it to be in? Kind of the, you know, next three, four, five years. Well, when we when we first set it up, um, there was a people weren't hostile. They were just puzzled. Why do we need you? Uh, and it's like, well, healthcare, uh, the scale of avoidable harm hasn't significantly changed in, in, in the 20 years that there's been a greater understanding of the, the scale of uh, avoidable harm and, yeah. and, the, and the system's failure. And we're like, well, we, you know, just doing what we're doing is not, is not working well enough. The, the, there have to be spaces to, 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 to hold the healthcare system to account to do better. I mean, you know, you often quote, we often quote the figure in the UK of 11,000 avoidable deaths a year. Well, with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, uh, you know, their, their reference to the stresses on the, on, the, on the system now, you know, that's probably doubling in, in terms of people that aren't accessing quickly enough emergency care and the consequential impact on their ill health and early deaths. So, you know, it's not getting any easier. And we think we've got a, a, a kind of, a voice that can, as I say, listen, uh, learn, and promote the voice of the patient safety frontline. So there's a there's a there's a increasing noise level about more is needed, and there are many, many kind of uh, you know there are charities in this space in the UK with AVMA, a patients association. There are mechanisms like Health Watch and others. But what we bring is this kind of system focus. So yes, mm -hmm. it's 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 focused on patients and their safety and also healthcare worker safety staff safety because they are two sides of the same coin so i think there is there is a really strong awareness raising campaigning element that should be a, should be global so i'm contributing to a meeting on the implementation of the global patient safety action plan i'm doing that in a few weeks time so that our voice that you know 
grounded in insight from the NHS, but increasingly globally can inform what, what's happening at a kind of global level. And, and I think, you know, our hub is a vehicle for sharing knowledge, insights, access to peer-reviewed literature, blogs, testimonies, communities of practice that are sharing knowledge amongst themselves. You know, more of that, uh, more of it in the UK, more of that globally. So what we're doing now is is creating uh, the, the, I think, well, creating and in partnership, the capacity for people to learn and apply that learning and then to celebrate that and share it, share it on and, you know, move it forward. Yeah. So I, I think it's it, in the future, it will be more of those how to resources, maybe working with health tech companies on the design of what they do to make this this work better to work with human factors uh, experts to look at how safe ma- safety management systems apply in other industries and how to adapt and apply them in healthcare. So there's a there's a mass of work to be done, and we think we've got a fairly unique space to be able to um, contribute to that. I mean, you mentioned kind of uh, front line there, so we, we know that when a serious incident happens, it doesn't just affect the patient or the families, it can also affect the workers on the front line. Um, so kind of well-being and, and kind of that individual or staff members, how do you and how does the charity specifically help NHS workers who are on the front line? Yeah, uh, some of it's that uh, a kind of awareness raising campaigning. I mean, last year, World Patient Safety Day was about healthcare worker safety, staff safety. And, and so we contributed a lot um, to, to getting that, better understood that if you if you don't have your workforce being physically and psychologically safe you know they are they're not going to be in a an environment and a culture or be given the kind of resources to apply their expertise safely so they need to be given the the resources the tools they need to be working in a safe system i mean if you're if you're an error provoking environment you will make errors healthcare is complex and complicated those errors may lead to harm. You need to protect staff from that. Uh, and and if you've got a toxic blame culture, which in certain parts of healthcare, that's still all too prevalent, and you treat people raising concerns as, you, you treat and vilify them as whistleblowers and you know destroy their careers because they've dared to challenge the system, we're not gonna get safer care. So, so part of it is calling for that culture of safety and hmm. the design of safety for staff but when something does go wrong you know it the majority of uh, uh unsafe care is it the causal factors are systemic to that organization yeah. so blaming an individual for making an error that's led to harm you know very few healthcare workers deliberately cause harm there are some aberrant people that do but they are such small numbers. I mean, it, so if we we need to we need to recognise that when healthcare workers have been involved in a safety incident, particularly a serious safety incident, that's enormously traumatising for them. They don't they yeah. don't train to to work in this field if they're not care, caring and compassionate people, and to f- consider that they've been involved in the harm of a, another human being, but also someone under their care is hugely tra- traumatising. So, what what we're aware of uh, and healthcare systems have been aware of for a long time is that we don't always we're not always putting the right support mechanisms around people and, and recognizing the pain and distress that they're under at the time of the incident uh, when there's any investigation or even after that and there have been some horrible stories where people have been uh, um, you know asked to go home after an incident and, and have you know are driven distracted and distressed and they've driven to their deaths in a road traffic accident you know because they, they they've not had the support in, in place so what one thing that we did and we published it last year and it's on our it's on our website is um is a staff support guide for particularly for staff involved in serious incidents and mm. it, we've brought together resources insights knowledge from research inquiries you know it's all in the it's all in the guide but the guide is 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 very practical it's at three stages when an incident happens and the support needed around the staff member at that time how they get the information how they get the support both 
practical support and psychological support. And then in what might be quite a protracted period of, of investigation, which may be or review, which may be internal, may involve a coroner's inquest, may be you know, uh, professional regulatory uh, investigation, you know, really quite long and complex, what support arrangements are needed to be uh, shared with them about what's going on, how they can be yeah. helped. And then after the, you know, after that period, how people can, because it can be so psychologically damaging and traumatic, how can they become, uh, um, how they can become healed and how they can become an effective worker. And we know that uh, people that have been involved in serious incidents often are, are much more risk averse. They're much more anxious about making mistakes and, and that, on one level is commendable on another level it may be quite constraining about their clinical practice because they're nervous they're scared that this could happen to them again and they don't want to cause any harm so we've we've pulled that into a guide um, and we're we're working to create that as a you know ideally an app or as a tool so people can access it so it's for for staff uh, and, and their supporters, their trade unions, whoever. It's for managers about what they need to put in place and it's for organisational leaders like HR or organisational development uh, yeah. kind of experts, what what the organisation needs to put in place in terms of policy framework resources. Uh, and we, we've got a conference in, um, we work as part of a safety for all campaign, healthcare worker, um, patient safety together. We've got, a, we've got our first safety for all conference 7th of december uh, and we're we're having people who have worked in this space and have made improvements some great initiatives at the royal free uh, and others demonstrating how how uh, what is needed but how there are practical tools to apply it so we we're definitely going to be carrying on working in this space to try and support both patients and families and system improvement but also making sure that that staff are supported uh, yeah, as, well. I mean, as you say, it must be really tough because the, the process in some cases can go on, as, as you say, for months, you know, it's not just the initial incident, it's everything that happens afterwards, right? The way well, so, sometimes it can go on for years if you've got yeah, multiple yeah, yeah, exactly. layers, you yeah. know, if you're involved in a really big inquiry, um, then that could be a formal public inquiry, inquest, or so. yeah, it, 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 it's tough. And I, I know of staff that have spoken to us who have been incredibly well supported by their organisations. So there is good practice out there, but it's trying to make sure that everyone knows what that is, and it's being applied consistently. And by putting the guide out, then if we can make that more well known, then people can say, well, look, this is good practice. This is what you need to be doing to support me. And, and you know, and they're trying Trade unions and, and others could could be actively encouraging organisations to do more where where more is needed. I mean, have you got any examples of where it's been adopted so far? As you say, I know it's kind of relatively new, but any any examples of people been using it? We haven't. We haven't. Um, I think we will do a bigger push when we, if we're able to develop a, a, a kind of an app on it, we will have a, yeah. a bigger kind of marketing push on it. So we know that we know that people are taking it and are using it and we've had feedback, but we haven't, it's not like a, you know, if we were NHS England or something and it was being yeah. launched with a, you must do this. You know, when we're not an organisation that can can direct people to do it, but we can we, we work in hope by disseminating it through the hub and social media and conferences. And, and our feedback is that it's being very well received. I don't know at an organisational level how much it's being picked up. I think we've got we could do much more of engaging with particularly, say, the HR community and others. Yeah. I mean, it is built into our organisational standards. So if an organisation adopts the standards, that comes as part of what good looks like. But, yeah, no, I can't really answer that question yet. Uh, and I, you know, I'd like to be able to. But I, I think we, we, I think if we can get some sort of technology platform to promote it, that will really make a difference. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll look forward to the app. Um, you've kind of touched on a few of the other questions I've had actually. So one of the, it, it kind of goes to what you were talking about maybe a few minutes ago, we were talking about kind of the culture and kind of incident reporting being used as, you know, something to scare people. So, you know, I'm going to day six, you being kind of the, the one everybody says. Um, and there was a quote the other day that came out from one of the maternity reports, and it was, "If you want to look for so this was to, this was to the um, to the mother whose baby had died. If you want to look for blame, you should be looking at the obstetricians, not me." 
how do we, so, you know, you've got your well-being thing on one side and then on the other side you've got this culture thing. How do you go about tackling that and how do you change how people, you know, think? It, it, it is the most difficult question I get asked and it's not as if I've got a magic wand that can go, ah, culture change, there you go. Uh, because it is, you know, there's no there's no one organisational culture, is there? You know, there are, no. there are micro cultures, there are cultures between clinical groups, there are cultures between... Uh, clinical and non-clinical staff there are you know behaviors at a leadership level i mean it, organizations and bureaucracies the scale of uh, you know the nhs or the healthcare industry is is hugely uh, complex uh, and difficult but part of it is actually knowing i think as an organization or we've got this as you know one of the the core foundation if you like of of in the foundation we described in our blueprint for action and our standards framework is around organizational culture and i think some of it is having a, a vision and a set of standards and what 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 you want to achieve being very yeah. honest about that uh, and and being very aspirational about that at a leadership level not just kind of like the patient safety managers but actually the chief exec the chair of the board the non-execs absolutely what does good look like and what kind of organization culture we want not not and and something that you can you can touch and feel it's it's it's, it's the leadership behaviors and the and the behaviors within the organization so i think it's setting those goals and then then knowing where you are having yeah. a view of where those where, well what those go and there are there are some really quite complex culture assessment tools out there. there um, I was having a conversation with a colleague yesterday. They're looking to do a cultural assessment. Which tool would we recommend? And I, 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 I wouldn't say I'm a particular expert in this area, but there are a number of tools that can be applied. Um, uh, there are a number of ways of getting insight as to your organizational culture, you know, from just staff attitude surveys from you know from getting feedback from from patients you know what does your freedom to speak up guardian say i mean i i was speaking to one freedom to speak up guardian and and he said i'm not given any time off to do this role and and staff speak to me and say you know i'll share with you how distressed i am about something i've seen but i don't want you to do anything about it because i'm really worried that X, Y, and Z yeah. will happen. And and, yeah. and so few people were formally reporting their concerns to the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian. And he had that conversation with his chief exec and chair, and they said, well, people aren't raising concerns because we don't have a problem with culture here. And, you know, they were refusing to accept that there was anything that they so needed strange, to engage in. Yeah. And, I think it's, it's so, almost two things, isn't it? There's, there's that bit you mentioned, you know, that chief exec level for want of a better way of explaining it, but that, that, that top down culture of almost if you're true. not if you're not embodying it at that level, how do you expect anybody else to embody it? Yeah. And then yeah. again, just and a how perception. do you call people out? How do you call yeah, people out yeah. for it? So that's the yeah. thing, you, you know, you, you, you've got, if you've got a framework for what you think good looks like and you've got a handle on what the, the challenges and issues are, then what are you going to do about it? So, so in the NHS patient safety strategy, it talks about developing uh, tools to support culture change. Now, that came out just before COVID. So, you know, things are slow yeah. in, in moving and i i understand there is a culture there's a work there's a working group looking at these issues um i don't think the terms of reference are published maybe they have but certainly the membership isn't published nor is it clear to me and maybe i'm just not up to date of when that's going to be something is going to be produced but but we need more examples of where people have made transformational changes you know mercy care are the, the the organization everyone goes to you know they've yeah. been working on this for a decade they've had the same chief exec the same director of hr and organizational development they've had an amazing chair you know it has been top priority for that organization and they have delivered massive improvements in the quality of care they've reduced severity of incidents they've got a much more open culture of reporting they've got a much happier workforce turnover's got you know it's like it's the triple wins isn't it you yeah 100 um so they've become a much more successful organization now how do how do other organizations go on that journey and and what are the tools that they need but i think if you've got if you've got leadership that is just tokenistic about this 
then and and not prepared to to tackle these uh, because it's really hard I, i've got yes. two anecdotes if i quickly mention them one Go is <laughs> um the medical dean and i i know um professor albert Wu is uh the professor of um patient safety I'm not sure what his full title is at Johns Hopkins and, and a, a yeah. huge global lead, leader on patient safety. And I worked with Albert when I worked at WHO. So, uh, and he now um, is the editor of uh, the, you know, patient safety clinical risk journal. So we're, we're in contact quite a lot, but he told me a fantastic story about a new medical dean that had been appointed to the university at Johns Hopkins, you know, incredibly prestigious medical yeah. school and, and, and hospital. And she was a a young woman. I think she's only in her kind of early 50s now or something. So woman, early 50s, that's a bit bit of a shake the tree appointment, I think. And and she started having, uh, my understanding is she started having coffee conversations. So you would have, you know, a clinical leader, maybe a professor, maybe a a very experienced medical director within the organisation. But there were problems about behaviour. Uh, yeah. and, and culture and she would invite them for a cup of coffee uh, which initially seemed ooh, quite prestigious being invited to come and have a chat with a medical dean and she would she would not talk about their clinical work she's just saying I'm hearing some things about behaviors that I want to talk to you about I, I need to know you know how are things with you are you okay um, but you know we we've got some clear um, uh, uh, issues here that we need to work through. How can I help you? And then, uh, so that was quite surprising. And you can imagine the waves yeah. that created in the organization. You know, second cup of coffee invite is like, mm, we're still not seeing the progress <laughs> we're looking for here. How can we help you further? And, and with with the view that, you know, they may not be a third cup of coffee. So, yeah. you know, really being able to demonstrate that. And, and one of the medical directors that I work quite closely with you know, he was saying, you know, there are at his organization, they've been consultants that are that are successful clinically, but Mm. have, um, uh, uh, but but how can they really be successful clinically from a patient safety point of view, if they're bullying, intimidating to their staff, uh, they don't listen, they're not learning and making improvements, he's had to move a few of those on. Now, that's obviously done sensitively, quietly, but those are the things, you know, if you can't support that behavioral change and people aren't willing to go there, then, you know, action needs to be taken. And, 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 and leaders that are doing that have to be quite, you know, have to be very sophisticated. They have to have the right organizational support, but they have to be quite brave. But that's, yeah. that's the kind of change. And, and, and you mentioned, you know, uh, reference to the East Kent inquiry. And clearly, you know, we've seen time and time again in those maternity inquiries, really poor relationships between obstetricians and midwives. And so it's not just individual organisations. There is something not right there, is there? And mm. I mean, Bill Kirker makes a number of recommendations in that in that area. But, but I think when we look at patient safety, we often focus on processes and what needs to change. It's the behavioural changes that are, that will make huge differences. And they are, people don't, always have the tools or the skills or the commitment to do that okay um so kind of back to patient safety learning so tell me a little bit about the patient safety learning hub what can people expect to find there so you've kind of touched on it as we've gone through this conversation but you know if you if i'm you know looking to join looking to access the website what am i what am i looking at when, when we started it, I mean, we started from this presumption, you know, I keep banging on about our blueprint for action and, and you know, yeah. kind of shared learning and how people needed to access it. And we, we were proposing that we would develop something like the hub. And, and again, you know, feedback for us was, well, we never had one of those. Why would we need it kind of thing? And, and we yeah. felt that um, we commissioned uh, Professor Carl McRae, who's now at Nottingham. He was then working with Charles Vincent at University of Oxford, and he was, hugely influential in 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 a report that helped then create HSIB. So a massive big brain around uh, patient safety systems learning. And, yeah. and he looked at, uh, uh, for us, at the early days of patient safety learning, he looked at a number of other uh, industries and how they share learning. And, um, and he looked at, um, um, uh, Oh, what's it called? I've forgotten the name. In aviation, it's called yeah. Sky Sky Lab Sky. 
something or other. Anyway, and it is the repository of knowledge around safety for the whole of the aviation industry. Now, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're an air traffic controller, whether you're a safety lead, whether you're a pilot, whether you're involved in training, anything and everything about how that safety management system operates in aviation, it's agnostic to any any yeah. manufacturer, you know, it's independent, but everything is there. So any, anyone can access it and looked at that as a model. And we looked in healthcare, how, you know, there are knowledge repositories in healthcare around safety, but had we got anything that looked like that? And, and we felt that we hadn't. So what we did was to take that insight from uh, Carl's, uh, Carl's work. And we pulled together a group of, Patients, uh, clinicians, uh, safety experts, human factors experts, policy leads, whole, whole group of people and said, if we were going to design one of these things, yeah. what, we, what would be useful to you? So we kind of, it, it, we, we designed it definitely as we've talked on a, you know, in relation to LFPSE and other things, Mark, but, you know, yeah. we, we designed it with users for users. And so we, the content of the hub was shaped by those early discussions and then what people that are using it are finding valuable and then we're, we're building on that. So, so some of it is, is, um, it, it kind of it, it's explicit and tacit knowledge as well. Some of it is a very, you know, our learn element is a repository of knowledge. So you can find peer reviewed uh, resource, peer reviewed research, resources, report inquiries, you know, all that rich content globally. I mean, it's not just restricted yeah. to the UK, there's yeah. a lot of UK content because the UK has done a lot in patient safety. So, and we're here as well. So that's where we started, but there's a lot of insight. It has news. So the news of the day, more UK focus, but some global focus too about what's happening. So you can keep up to date. Um, it has events on it. So it promotes various uh, in-person in and online events. And then uh, we've got a really interesting section of it, which is the community section. Some of those are open and some of those are private communities where people can have discussions and engage. And we support that with, you know, kind of webinars or like the patient safety management network that we support is their network and they have weekly drop-ins but the content of those unattributably themed sharing yeah. knowledge learning is all on there so uh, we invite people to contribute to it by saying what more they think would be helpful to be on there so guiding us about what, how we can continue to develop it mm -hmm. and then we we invite people to contribute in terms of their knowledge and expertise so if they want to raise a concern or an issue or a campaign or they want to share some good practice um we do we've got um the sussex community a shout out for the amazing people down there they they do this incredible um newsletters very personalized they've really changed their engagement with staff down there and and so we we regularly put that content on there there's there's good practice content we uh we've had a a clinician write for us on um on covid and vascular uh the the, the impact in terms of the vascular system on covid and what yeah clinicians and patients need to know about that we we put that blog up there on thursday i think we've had over twelve thousand page views 60 percent of those in the u.s in the, in the u.s we're wow. identifying where there are gaps in knowledge or if there's new innovation we can promote it and we do that by putting it on the hub but very closely linked with our social media strategy about what we put on twitter and uh, LinkedIn and uh, uh, those are the main two vehicles. So uh, personal perspectives, testimonies, issues of risk, good practice, anything and everything to do with patient safety and, yeah. and you know, systemic, the systemic nature of it, really. Um, it's evidence based. We've got um, we've got content moderators. We've got editors who are experienced in this. So, you know, we're, we're not going to put anything dodgy on there. Um, yes. uh, you know, it's a safe place, but and it's free to use. So we do invite people to register um, because then we know who you are, where you're from, uh, yeah. and we can send you a uh, you know a monthly newsletter on all the good bits that you might not have picked up on if you like. Um, since 
we've got a, a big fat zero marketing budget for it. It's kind of word of mouth, social media growth, but we've had a million page views. Uh, last year, we were half a million, so we've doubled in a year. We would expect that trajectory. We've had access from over 200 countries. I think 95% of NHS trusts have got, you know, formal membership um, uh, of their staff from, from, from the hub. And we get thousands and thousands of page views uh, and uh, and people have uh, have said that it's helped them so much if they're researching good practice or an issue it's a it's a it's a great knowledge repository it's it's, it's still growing we're still new so there's yeah. always more to put on there but um do do check it out use I, it i already it. have yeah no i just, yeah, I, I definitely have um, i mean you kind of touched on it there so i mean and we touched on it in an earlier um podcast so in terms of you kind of helping people move into new frameworks or underpinning new processes. So from a practical element, and, and again, you, you kind of have touched on it a little bit, how do you as a charity kind of help people, um, especially obviously the NHS in this case, um, support transitions to new processes or new frameworks? Yeah, so there's there's quite a few different ways in which we can, can contribute and we're constrained by how much we do by our size. We're still very small yeah. uh, and our ambition is huge <laughs> but the kind of things that we do um are some of you know like th- through some of the networks the, the there's a, another network that's been created by colleagues in uh, uh th- you know th- two anaesthetists and a surgeon who created the national natsips network and they are yeah. they are the clinical leads for the natsips review to look at you know the safety of invasive procedures they've created a, a network that has over 350 400 members we support them in doing that in in organizing their meetings their online meetings they've got a presentation from uh, uh two amazing investigators from hsib that are looking at um how PSERF can be embedded and work with uh, the invasive uh um um uh, uh um you know the natsips review yeah. and the new guidelines that are coming out so what we said in an earlier podcast is you know lots of kind of single stream initiatives coming out nationally how are those integrated at a local level so there's a yeah. there's a meeting next week specifically to do that so it, it I, I'm, I'm going into a bit of detail about that because that demonstrates the kind of bringing people together sharing the knowledge looking yeah. at how to apply it and then being able to put content we'll we'll video that one so that we can put content on and that will become a tool for kind of learning so there are some sort of practical things as well as obviously all the content on the hub but probably the biggest area which is um not specifically hub related but is around the our view of um the healthcare as an industry would work yeah. more effectively as a safety management system. So we we have recently published a an interview with um, Keith Conradi, recently um, uh, you know chief inspector at, um, at HSIB. We're doing some work with uh, Ted Baker, who is actually going to HSIB as chair shortly. Yeah. Again on safety management systems and what we've been doing in developing uh, that that concept is creating a set of organizational standards for patient safety that describe what good looks like built on the work we were doing in the blueprint for action but since then working with experts doing more research and creating a kind of conceptual framework and template and content knowledge of if you are going to stop you know as an organization how should you be delivering patient safety as an organization what 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 is good practice and advice telling you and we've designed that as a standards framework with tools for people to assess their performance against it to help design and prioritize their improvement journey so quite a lot of very rich content around that and then as we've started working with a number of organizations who are adopting it realizing yeah. that actually there's a lot of opportunity for cross organizational learning about how they're doing it so i think we'll be creating more networks of people that are adopting the standards so we've got the medical director of one of the organizations we're working with he's going to be engaging with the chief nurse who lives on patient safety in another one and talking about how how they're designing their transformational change journey 
so they get the insight and benefit from that organization's learning and then they can translate it not only to their organization but what they're developing in their local ics so lots of ways of I don't know, uh, you know, creating and supporting effectively a social movement for change. Really. Yeah, I mean, it's, and obviously we've just started working together as organisations and, and it kind of makes sense because we share the same goals um, and it's clear that both organisations want to make a difference. Is there anything else that you look for in a partnership when you're looking to work with somebody else? I, I think uh, I, I, th- I think the, the, the core concept for us is if we want the healthcare, healthcare to be safe, and we want to work effectively as a uh, uh, as a safety management system. We've got to think in terms of that overall system. So it's yes. not just about providers uh, and funders, commissioners of healthcare. It's about how regulators operate and 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 what kind of action and behaviours. Uh, that how people respond to that system regulation through CQC and others, but also the professional regulation through the GMC, NMC and others, the role of the Royal Colleges, you've got NICE, you've got various arms length bodies, you've got HSIB, you've got, you know, NHS England. There are there are a plethora of organisations in this kind of safety ecosystem and, yeah. uh, and, 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 and particularly working collaboratively with those new roles like the patient, Henrietta Hughes, the patient safety commissioner, and industry. You know, there's been this real divide between industry that work, uh, you know, either the providers of medical devices or pharma or technology providers or entrepreneurs or whatever. You know, it it, 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 it seems a missed opportunity not to work collaboratively yeah. in partnership, knowing that, you know, there are commercials uh, that we have to be mindful of and procurement processes but actually how we how we design our healthcare system to be safe for patient needs all those partners together so you know big bang about you know partnership and collaboration but ultimately i think it's the values base that's that yes. why, why we would choose to engage with a, a, an organization and work with an organization that that the, the the values around improvement and safety yes people have different commercial levers and uh, and incentives but it's about the, those, those those kind of aims and how we can work across the publicly funded healthcare, the independent sector, work with you know all, all aspects to make that change happen. So I think if we're all pushing in the same direction, we'll get there yeah. quicker and better. Would be our view. And then obviously, okay, so- in terms of partnership, we're a small charity. We don't have enough money to do what we're doing at the moment, let alone our ambition. So some of our partnerships with some of the medtech industry have helped shape with our, with the SHBN network. We've created the Safety for All campaign and they, they give us a, a little bit of money. You know, that funding helped us create the the staff safety manual uh, that we've we talked about previously you know they didn't they didn't commission it they didn't design it they didn't direct it but that ele- that gave us money to to to, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to deploy in doing that work so partnerships are good for all sorts of reasons but uh, <laughs> i think you, you, very nice too yeah exactly but pulling all, all pulling towards that north star though if we're saying that's patient yes. safety i think they yeah. say that vision and making sure we're all going in this we each contribute a different thing to whatever yeah. that journey looks like together. So yeah, yeah. I think. So kind of one last question. Ooh, can I, I can I just say? I mean, I went. Can, I, go on. I, I, I was on a uh, the WHO who I used to work for did you know some of their global challenges are fantastic and they have amazing yeah. resources. I mean the the, the medication safety uh, um, world patient safety day fairly recently and the resources that they pulled together are spectacularly good and I've yes. made great connections with those. But but you know there was their big launch. There were about thousand people on that webinar. Yeah. Wasn't anyone there from pharma? Right. And it's kind of, you know, it, it, it is the very nature of WHO being part of the UN system, their understandable nervousness about being compromised by commercials. But given, you know, all those issues that uh, Henrietta Hughes, as the new patient safety commissioner, talked about at the Health Service General Congress uh, 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 in, in uh, September, um, 
uh, October, you know, around medication labeling, lookalike, sound alike yeah. drugs, all those issues are safety issues where we need to collaborate with industry on those. We need to set standards. We need to help shape those improvement journeys. Uh, just being kind of defined by or, or restricted, sorry, by that commercial relationship uh, it, it is frustrating. And really big shout out for the NHS supply chain here. Their, their, their safety, small safety team are really working hard to put safety at the core of procurement and supply chain issues you know those mm. uh, those kind of infrastructure design w- will make a huge difference though they, they probably don't get uh, often the acknowledgement for the importance of that kind of work so partnerships throughout the system is not just you know important partnerships between clinicians i mean it is this this broader industry partnership so last question um and it kind of a magic wand moment. So if you were going to, you know, we roll forward 10, 15, 20 years, would you see healthcare like in the future? And what do you, what would you like to see the most improvement of? I mean, there's an obvious answer there, which is what we've been talking about, but is there anything kind of specific that you would kind of say, well, what does it look like in 20 years? It's interesting. I read this morning, uh, Richard Smith, who used to be the uh, ex-editor of the BMJ. He, 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 blog and I've, I've, re, I've retweeted it about Ivan Illich's book and I can't remember the actual title of it but it was published some oh I don't know it must have been 30 40 years ago and it was about yeah. the nature of healthcare and its relationship with its public and with patients and I, I read it I, I studied psychology at university and I read it when I was there and it had a profound impact on me, uh, which I've come back to, but but it was saying that the the healthcare industry, and he used it in a not particularly uh, uh, positive yeah. term, w- was not was not uh, there were he called out patient safety before even people called about patient safety and said that we yeah. the medicalization of society um, had. Um, this is a bit of a longer and rambling answer, sorry, but Goodness the medicalization fine. of society where you, you can, you know, healthcare industry fixes everything for you and uh, creates a dynamic between the providers of healthcare and patients, which are not wholly, and, and it's been shown to be right, you know, you, those power dynamics are, are not always in the best interests of the, uh, the best quality care. So I think a, a transformation about making sure that we provide patient-centered care and patients and families are engaged in that and those power dynamics and hierarchies are diminished which isn't to say that clinicians aren't the the knowledge and have the expertise to help make those decisions but i think there's a rebalancing uh, and that taking that approach and and some of the things we've talked about will put patient and patient safety at the heart of it because we cannot afford to to harm unintentionally the the, the the people that we do and it costs yeah. a fortune healthcare as an industry is more of our gdp is being spent on healthcare for all sorts of reasons as you know people like me are getting older and will live longer and will need more care but the oecd has said 15 percent of all healthcare spend in the developed world relates to the cost of unsafe care um, and I was talking to Ted Baker about this this week, and he scribbled it down. He's like, well, that's 23 billion in the UK. If we can apply some of that more proactively and design for safety, design our healthcare yeah. systems to deliver safe care, it will be it will be more cost effective. It'll be better for everyone. Uh, and, and in doing that, we need to look after our workforce. So I haven't said one thing, have I? I've said it's kind of that's three. Fine. It's about the relationship. <laughs> I give you a magic wand. Yeah, yeah. You can have a, yeah. a three-pronged one. So relationship with patients and family, you know, that yeah. kind of systems uh, kind of focus uh, and supporting our, for design and our supporting our workforce. At the moment, people are exhausted, uh, uh, demoralised. Yeah. You know, we're not going to resolve the healthcare workforce shortage by recruiting nurses from Nepal. You know, we need to we need to look at the reasons why people are leaving in droves and, and address those issues. And some of those around the environment, the pressure, the the culture, uh, and they're not those are not quick fixes. But if we don't look after our workforce, you know, we won't have the healthcare system that we we all need as patients. 
yeah, I think that's probably a good place to end actually. And then probably on one of the key issues over the next, you know, definitely in the moment and uh, over the next yeah, yeah. few years. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for joining us this week. And yeah, thanks again to Helen. Um, if you can join us next week, please for our new episode and don't forget to rate and subscribe. And if you've got any questions for us or our guests, then please email whatthehealthtech at riddahealthcare.com. Mm-hmm.